I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close-Up. It's been yet another jaw-dropping week. We'll try to address some of the events with my Times colleagues. In a moment, International New York Times op-ed columnist Roger Cohn, he'll bring us views of America and the president from his international vantage point. NYTimes.com video journalists talked with some very happy women after they learned Democratic candidate Doug Jones was the apparent winner, would become their new senator. My Times colleagues weigh in on our lead stories of the week with the backstory, and I'll close with some final thoughts on CODA. But first, International New York Times op-ed columnist Roger Cohn. Roger, welcome and thanks for joining us. What does America look like from abroad? Are people laughing at us? Are they shrugging their shoulders? Are they saying, well, you know, they're no worse than we are or what? Well, Sam, uh, almost a year into the Trump presidency, I'd say there's a lot of dismay around the world. Uh, in Germany, people try to dismiss President Trump as a joke. Uh, in Britain, he's seen as a loose cannon, particularly after retweeting those uh, anti-Muslim uh, messages from a British fascist party. Uh, I think generally people feel dismayed that Americans elected into an office a man uh, so needy, uh, so bellicose, uh, and so unstatesmanlike. And what is it actually doing to foreign policy? Are they adjusting to it? or? defensively acting or? Well, Sam, you know, the United States remains, even though there are power shifts going on in the world, it remains the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And whatever misgivings Angela Merkel in Germany or Theresa May or Xi Jinping in China, uh, whatever misgivings they may have about President Trump, they are not in a position where they're going to sever uh, relations. But I think you're seeing Asian nations forming trading pacts without the United States. Mm -hmm. You're seeing Emmanuel Macron in France and Merkel talking about strengthening the European Union and having to forge our own destiny now because you can no longer rely on the United States. So there are shifts going on. It has to be said that the president hasn't taken us over a cliff yet. So, uh, and maybe he won't. And maybe you, he won't. You did point out, though, that the uh, plan to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv mm -hmm. to Jerusalem obviously has implications, but you said it's not going to destroy the peace process in the Middle East because there isn't a peace process. Yeah, I thought the reaction was a little overblown. Um, there is no peace process. I can't see what possible peace idea Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, can come up with. The Palestinians at this point have said anyway they don't want anything uh, to do with it. I think the president's statement at least uh, had the merit of uh, not being the same peace process blather. Uh, it recognized the reality. Um, uh, I think it should have said something about the Palestinians' aspirations for a capital in some part of East Jerusalem. But there is no more deeply felt sentiment among Jews than that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And um, so it at least had, had that merit at some cost. One of the things you said recently, and I think it's very true, is that the Democrats have not yet begun a serious reckoning with their defeat last year and therefore are not uh, sophisticatedly looking ahead uh, till 2020. Do they have a candidate? What are the alternatives? I don't think the Democratic Party has a candidate as yet. And clearly what's just happened in, in Alabama, uh, pretty remarkable, uh, and does show that a lot of Americans are dismayed, much like people around the world, by what's been going on uh, in the White House of late. Uh, I, I saw, to some degree, the Trump victory uh, coming. I spent some time in Kentucky in August 2016. I'd, I'd covered Brexit in Britain. It was a time when people wanted disruption at, at any cost. And I think the great failing of liberals in this country has been the contempt that has been shown for uh, supporters of Donald Trump. There, are, there is a racist fringe, uh, but there are plenty of smart Americans who concluded that uh, they did not want to elect Hillary Clinton and they wanted President Trump to be president. So I think if the Democrats go into the next election with uh, any kind of similar 
uh, contempt, um, then there's a serious chance that despite what just happened in Alabama, um, President Trump could get a second term. Serious contempt or serious delusion as well. Yeah. Why do people believe him? Uh, when we talk about fake news, David Leonard of the Times uh, just did a survey because we had done, looked at the number of times that Trump lied in his first 10 months of office, yeah. 103 verifiable mm -hmm. untruths compared to, I think it was 18 over the entire yeah. uh, reign of uh, President Obama. Yeah. So how do you, how do people accept that? Do they not care? Well, this is deeply troubling, and when the truth gets devalued and people get disoriented, that's what autocrats want, because they begin to look to the leader as the sole fund of truth. So the devaluation of truth, the blurring of the line between truth and falsehood is deeply worrying. But look, I think the president has acted more as the president of a movement, as the leader of a movement, than as president of all Americans since he took office. And he gets uh, their blood up. He gets the pulse racing. He gets across to people who feel that the elites who brought the uh, Great Recession of 2008, uh, the Iraq War, uh, you know, outside the United States, the Euro crisis, um, that brought growing social inequality, that brought impunity. Uh, they want somebody to stick it to those folk mm -hmm. and who is doing it better and more effectively and more vociferously than anyone else It's President Trump. So uh, they are prepared to overlook these untruths. There's also, Sam, a, an issue, I think, about uh, what truth is because all the Trump supporters I've met say he's the most honest president we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Now, why do they say that? They say that because he tells it like it is. He tells it like it is. He says it. he does exactly what he said he would do. What president has been more honest? So in that understanding of honesty, speaking bluntly equals honesty rather than whether or not what is being said corresponds to the facts. So right now in the United States, there are at least two definitions of truth. How do we cover that? How do we cover the presidency, <laughs> cover Donald Trump without constantly saying he's lying about that or misstating this. Uh, I think we have to say that. Mm -hmm. I don't think we stop saying that. In fact, I think it took us a long time to say that during the campaign. I mean, he, we didn't call him a liar on, on, on the front page until pretty close to the election itself. Mm -hmm. Then we had a kind of catharsis and used it a lot, and now we've stepped back a bit uh, from that. I think uh, you have to call him to account. You have to you have to hold him to account, and part of holding him to account is making clear, you know, that when he says the leader of the Boy Scouts has called him to congratulate him, or the president of Mexico has, and he's invented this, the, the, the danger is that, of course, you begin to shrug, you know, you, the fact that the president lies and that a spokeswoman in the White House says, it's not really a lie, mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, and you begin to find this to be normal. I mean, that is, that is very troubling. There is an issue with the president with, and as a columnist, with repetition. I mean, how many times can you say he's dishonest? How many times can you say uh, how needy he is or how absurd some of what he tweets is? Um, Especially There's when a limit. And, um, you know, I find, I do find the need to write about other subjects. And Just especially because, when yeah. we're preaching to the converted to a great extent. Uh, yeah, preaching to the choir, preaching to the converted. Uh, again, for, I mean, how many people these days in the United States will change their minds? Um, I think it's a limited number. Um, I mean, I wrote a piece recently about Myanmar, Burma, and Aung San Suu Kyi, who'd been stripped of various honors because of her failure to speak out on the Rohingya. And I tried to, in that piece, describe her particular difficulty because um, she's not actually the president. Mm -hmm. uh, they've invented a title for her. And why? Because it's a partial handover of power and the military is still very dominant. And I did find that on that issue, for example, so many, a lot of people wrote to me and said, you know, you helped me see it in a slightly different way. But I think that is pretty rare these days because and it's become almost a cliche. It is so easy mm -hmm. to go to the news source or the website that comforts you in the view you already hold. 
and to go to a network or uh, a website that is is more challenging is is difficult. It's you know we're living a moment of transition in our democracies. I mean the full effect of Facebook now two billion users of social media. Uh, we don't really know it. Mainstream parties are collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to mobilize the mob. Uh, it's very easy to mobilize the mob. We're moving towards some kind of more direct democracy. Um, it's dangerous. It's treacherous as any moment of change. But maybe it also contains some hope down the line. I hope so. We'll keep reading your column for guidance. Roger Cohn of the New York Times. You can read his thoughtful columns on nytimes.com, as well, of course, as in the print edition. And when I return, how African-American voters change the course of Alabama politics. It was an election that galvanized the nation. On Tuesday, Alabama voters learned the results of the highly charged campaigns by a former judge backed by a president and a prosecutor backed by out-of-state senators. The result, Democrat Doug Jones, now Alabama's new senator. Black voters, by and large, responsible for this historic win in a red state. NYTimes.com video journalists were there. Traditionally, Alabama has been a red state, but I tell you, last night we bled blue. I'm getting emotional, I'm sorry, but it just meant a lot because those are the days that we're living for. I'm so sorry. But for us to come together and make something like last night happen, and I'm just so happy about that. <laughs> Black people in particular have political power here. We were able to flip Alabama, which totally, totally dispelled uh, the notions and the myths that, that our vote doesn't really matter, it doesn't count. The biggest number of population of who voted as African American women, it like made me proud. That if given the resources um, and given the opportunity uh, to support our community in this way, we will rise to the occasion. Yes, we do have a lot of work to do. Little progress is still progress. So I'm happy that we were able to get where we are today. More so black people were involved in this race because it was an opportunity to show the power of the black vote. That was really like cool that Alabama mattered so much and that I live in a state that was really about to make a huge impact on our country. When I was in that voting precinct and I saw all of the, the African Americans flooding in, it reminded me of eight years ago when, when President Barack Obama decided to run for president. Waking up this morning, seeing the world, the world, like in Germany, root for Alabama, congratulating us, and thanking black women. That has made my year. When we return, Times reporters with the backstory. Welcome back. A bombing in Times Square, verbal attacks on Senator Kirsten Gillibrand by the president, a rebuke to the president by Alabamans. Joining me to discuss these stories and more are my Times colleagues, contributing writer Eleanor Randolph, Albany Bureau, Bureau Chief Jesse McKinley, Metro reporter Rick Rojas, and Metro reporter for social services Nikita Stewart. Rick, you and Kristen uh, Hussey spent uh, months up at Sandy Hook in Connecticut reliving uh, the shooting that occurred there. You said it was one of the most difficult assignments being a reporter. It's a job that you said forces you to look wickedness in the world in the face. How do you get people to talk about that? And do they say anything that really adds to what we already know? It's very difficult to get people to talk because you, you have to really make the point that we don't want you to have to walk through everything that happened that day because that's something people are still five years later grappling with. We made the point that we want to look forward and look at, you know, we're reminded again and again 
what the toll of mass shootings are immediately. You know, we see the the candlelight vigils and the memorials that pop up, and we see, you know, the the, the president make the address and the thoughts and prayers offerings and all of that. But it's like, how does this sort of seep into the bloodstream of a community? How does it alter its identity? And we wanted to look at that, and and we found that people were more willing to talk about mm -hmm. that and like what it's like to live in this place and how you kind of find a way to keep going and, and just sort of establish a new equilibrium. Uh, the piece in the Times by the two of you, really very, very moving. Jesse McKinley, uh, is Andrew Cuomo running for re-election and is he running for president? Uh, yes, I think, and I don't know, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first, uh, the first question is easier. Obviously, he seems to be laying all the groundwork. He has said he wants a third term. Uh, that would be in 2018. Um, and in terms of 2020, I think that is a moving target. I think it kind of depends on who you talk to on what day. This was not a particularly great week for the governor. He had a little bit of a verbal gaffe yesterday on uh, Wednesday about the um, uh, about uh, sexual harassment policies that he apparently is going to be rolling out in January, but kind of fumbled with a question and accused a, a well-respected female reporter in Albany of doing a disservice to women by asking a question. Um, asking a question just about his administration instead of the broad issue. Yeah, I mean, as we put it, some would say he said she was doing a disservice. Most people would say she was simply doing her job. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not a particularly great week for the governor. That being said, he he seems to be on somewhat of a cruise control towards re-election. He only has one Republican candidate uh, so far, declared Brian Kolb, the Assembly Minority Leader, who, while being a kind of well-respected and nice enough guy, does not seem to be a formidable candidate uh, for Mr. Cuomo. Uh, but that being said, next year does not bode particularly well for him in terms of public relations. You know, he's got a number of uh, corruption trials of associates mm -hmm. coming up, um, and that could do some damage to the political brand. And next year we might wind up with three New Yorkers running for president uh, again, Gillibrand, uh, Cuomo, and de Blasio. De Blasio. <laughs> well, you know, I think, uh, I think 2020 for Cuomo, it really depends on how well he does next year. Um, you know, if he gets a really huge margin, that'll make a lot of difference. I mean, and I think, I was thinking about this, this sort of irritation that he that he displayed uh, over a perfectly reasonable question by a reporter and you know I think it, it was that he likes to have this grand announcement you know he likes to have trumpets blaring and you know and I am now announcing our our uh, sexual harassment policy and and this question um, sort of tripped him up a little bit and you could tell that he was incredibly irritated by it and you know I don't know how much of that Andrew Cuomo we're going to see over the next election season. And also I'd add that he had kind of gone to bat to try to knock down the Republican tax plan, which mm -hmm. seems to be uh, going towards approval at this point. Uh, and he and his aides say, look, he was very hot about this. He thought that he thought that they had a chance at at least getting rid of some of the more onerous provisions for the state. And it looks like he didn't succeed. Looks like not at all. Yeah. Nikita, uh, you had a story this week in the Times about a new strategy by the mayor to try to cope with homelessness. Is this going to work, and how big a dent is it actually likely to make? Um, we're talking about um, 3,000 people, that, but that's a, a good size um, dent than what the mayor had talked about previously, uh, <laughs> far more. Um, and, you know, when we talk about de Blasio and whether he's going to run for president, uh, you know, if he's going to make it to the national stage, he's wanted to present himself as this progressive and he's really tackling income inequality. And this is um, a strategy that is more aggressive than anything that he has um, put out there before. We're talking about um, actually, you know, using eminent domain, if necessary, against landlords to turn apartments they, that they've been keeping for 17 years now, using them as homeless shelters and basically getting all kinds of money out of the city, um, you're turning them into permanent housing. And that is, um, it's aggressive, it, you know, it's bold. It's, it hasn't been done before, at least not in New York City. And so uh, this could, you know, really put that dent. It is before winter, at least officially, but uh, are the numbers still up around 60,000? Yes, um, that is just in the city's primary shelter system. Um, really, when you add up the people in the streets and when you add up 
um, folks who are in uh, specialized shelters for young people and for victims of domestic violence. We're talking about 77,000 people. Hmm. Rick, uh, you had a story in the paper recently about uh, the influx of Puerto Ricans fleeing the hurricane, fleeing the economy on the island, tens of thousands, and people who might actually help there, young people, professional people. A lot of them are going to Florida. Are they coming to New York, too? Yes. And really what experts are saying, they could go across the country. It, it, there could be pockets of Puerto Ricans, you know, really establishing communities across the country now, but it really has the most potency in, in Florida right now. And they're Democrats? <laughs> That's right. Yes. I mean, by and large, yeah. yes. What about the implications of the tax bill? It is likely to be voted uh, this coming week, and so far uh, the provisions about mortgage interest and also deductibility of state and local taxes do not bode well for New York. Well, it looks to me as though that tax bill is aimed at New York, California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, all the big states that have have gone out of their way to try to take care of people and try to, to beef up the education system and make sure that the homeless are housed and, and try to keep the hospitals working. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a vindictive tax plan. And, um, and, and we'll just have to see. We haven't seen the final, I mean, I, they probably won't see the final bill until, until it comes right off the, the, the presses. presses. Or but uh, it, is, it is a very mean, in the, in the sort of broadest sense of the word mean, it's a very mean bill. And Jesse, is there anything New York State can do or the city can do legislatively or otherwise to respond to that, to ameliorate some of the uh, burdens that are going to be inflicted on New Yorkers? It's a, it's a pretty solid question. And, and to Eleanor's point, uh, you know, the governor's estimating at this point it's going to be a $4.4 billion with a B budget gap coming into to the next fiscal year. Uh, there's a possibility of another $2 billion cut in terms of Medicaid monies. Uh, this is, uh, in terms of 2018 being a tough year for Albany and a tough year for Governor Cuomo in particular, that makes it even more difficult. Uh, in terms of responses, you know, the governor would argue that this is part of a long-term plan on the behalf of Republican interests to kind of starve the beast. You know, what they want to do basically is force the state to make cuts, and the places you make cuts are in places like, you know, ed education and health care. Those are the two biggest pools of money. And if you can't cut there, then you have to cut from social services. And that, for Governor Cuomo, and I would suspect for Mayor de Blasio as well, that's where really where the rubber meets the road, and that's that's where I think they feel it's particularly punitive. Mm -hmm. Is there any economic justification for it? Is there any way that it grows the economy or does anything any good? Well, the the argument from Republican lawmakers like Chris Collins, who's a, the the kind of very uh, the Trumpian uh, representative out of the Buffalo area, is is look for a large part the people that are going to pay more for this are the one and two percent, the people whose houses might be worth you know a million two million dollars. Um, that actually the doubling of the standard deduction is actually going to help middle class peoples that if they look at a district of a 700,000 people it's only going to be a small fraction that are actually hit but for the state's finances in particular those people feed an enormous amount of money mm. into the state coffers so it's difficult to kind of write that with the idea that this is somehow good for the state as a whole. Thanks to Eleanor Randolph, Jesse McKinley, Rick Rojas and Nikita Stewart for joining us and I'll have some final thoughts on CODA. If you think your vote doesn't count, look at the results this month in Atlanta. More than 92,000 votes were cast in a mayoral runoff. The margin of victory, only 800. Or Alabama. Roy Moore lost the Senate race this week because disaffected Republicans deserted. In 2008, when Jeff Sessions was reelected to the Senate from Alabama, only about one-tenth of one percent of the voters wrote in the name of a candidate whose name was not on the ballot. In this week's Moore-Jones race, write-ins accounted for about 1.7 percent of the vote. Those 22,000 Alabamans who were dissatisfied with both official candidates amounted to more than Democratic Doug, jo Doug Jones's victory margin. Last month, more than 5,000 New Yorkers rejected the major and minor party candidates for mayor. Instead, they wrote in someone else. That's about three times more than four years ago. Mike Bloomberg received the most, nearly 1,000. 
I got one, or at least someone of the same name did. One is as many as Lady Gaga, Spike Lee, Eli Manning, Al Sharpton, and Alexander Hamilton. Unlike dozens of others who wrote in their own names, I didn't, I swear. Mayor de Blasio's campaign manager said he was unconcerned. While we are grateful for the more than three quarters of a million New Yorkers who voted for the mayor, he said, I simply can't argue with the 11 New Yorkers who wrote in the name of Nick Starr, Chris Stapps Porzingis. The re-election of Bill de Blasio last month was an object lesson. You can't beat something with nothing. Turnout was low. Many of those who did turn out were disaffected. And when they got to their polling place, the only alternative they could suffer was a protest vote for somebody, anybody, who was not on the ballot. There's a lesson there for New York Republicans who haven't won a statewide race since 2002. Not everyone likes Governor Cuomo, but if he seeks a third term in the new year, the naysayers need a viable alternative. That same lesson applies to Democrats if Donald Trump runs again in 2020, which is why engaging with government is so vital. Next year, New Yorkers will grapple with key congressional races, how to pay for mass transit, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's emergence as a leading voice against sexual abuse, and who knows what else, given our vulnerability to terrorist attacks. Chances are, if you're watching close up, you already care about what happens. If you're making a New Year's resolution, though, it's not enough to just complain about politics, whichever side you're on. Do something about it and make a difference. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.